Uh, the reading this morning is taken from John 12. Have we got the reading? I've got the Bible if we haven't. No, nope. don't worry. Oh, there was it. Yeah, there it is. Oh, here we are. Lovely. Right. John 12, uh, verses 12 to 36. Okay. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for all those down through the ages who have brought it to us. 
We thank you for our fellowship and our meeting together, and we thank you for your presence with us. And we pray now that you will open your word to us, to our hearts, to our souls, to our spirits, that we may glorify you out in the world. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. Reading uh, for a reason. And before I start uh, the sermon, can I say something that I've been asked to say? Um, anybody who doesn't know what Baruch Haba means, it's part of the phrase Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai. And it means blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's used still, Baruch Haba is still used in modern Hebrew as a greeting. Welcome, Baruch Haba. So, welcome the one who comes in the name of the Lord, as well as blessed. Now, have we got the slide? Have we got the slide? There it is. This happy-looking chap. It's called Dennis the Short. Or to give him his posh Latin name, Dionysius Exiguus. He's the chap who's responsible for the way in large parts of the world we divide history into things that happened before the birth of Jesus Christ and things that have happened since. In about 525 AD, he was trying to work out a way of predicting the date of Easter each year, which we all know is not that easy to work out. And he realized that to do that, he needed to be able to accurately and consistently number each year. Up to that point, and for quite a long time afterwards, people pinpointed a particular year by counting from the start of the king or the emperor's reign. You read in Luke 3, verse 1, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Or in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. Or they started at a particular major event, like the foundation of Rome, and counted from that. That was okay as far as it went most of the time, but it didn't have the long-term accuracy that Dionysius needed. So he hit on the idea of counting from the birth of Jesus Christ. Since, as far as he was aware, that was something everyone knew about. And he added the Latin phrase, Anno Domini, meaning in the year of the Lord, which got shortened to AD. (laughs) Unfortunately, his calculations were very slightly out, so that from our point of view, Jesus was actually born in 2 or 3 BC. (laughs) Anyway, not surprisingly... It took a long-term time to change the way people think. And it was several centuries before this actually started to catch on. And in her book called Measuring Time, Making History, Lynn Hunt remarks that the huge idea that there's before Jesus and after Jesus really only takes root in the 17th and 18th centuries So if A.D. is since the birth of Christ, what about before his birth? In his History of England in 731, the Venerable Bede, another monk, wrote the words, Before the Incarnation of Our Lord, which the scientist Isaac Newton later abbreviated to Before Christ, B.C., which has stuck in English, at least, in Welsh, of course, it's different. It's C.C. King Christ. This isn't consistent, the English B.C. and A.D. And a Frenchman, another monk, proposed ante Christum, or A.C. But the English stuck to B.C., fortunately for the electricians. We're all aware, of course, that moves are afoot to change AD and BC to CE, Common Era, and BCE, Before the Common Era, 
But in Time magazine in August 2016, Meryl Fabry wrote this. As some people stripped the terms of some of their religious connotations by using BCE or CE instead of BC and AD, especially in the last 30 years, counting from the birth of Christ still endures. Let's go back to the title, The Hinge of History. The term a hinge of history is often used in a variety of contexts to describe a time when the activity of humanity has a uniquely influential effect on the history of the world. I'll read that again. A time when the activity of humanity has a uniquely influential effect on the history of the world. In the children's address, we looked at some of the discoveries and inventions that changed the history of civilization. A hinge could also be a cataclysmic event, like the bubonic plague, or the First World War, or the development of atomic energy, or 9-11. But the point is that after whatever it was had happened, the world, for good or ill, was never the same again. My point in these two sermons, which bookend our celebration of Easter, is that though there are many events and ideas which you could call a hinge of history, only one short sequence of events could truly be described as the hinge of history, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. These events were preceded by a long run-up dating from creation and the fall of humanity through the plan and purpose of God to re-establish a people of his own and redeem humanity and culminating in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. The other side of the hinge, which we will explore in more detail in two weeks, is the difference these events have made to the history of the world, indeed the history of time itself. All through the Bible, we can trace how God set out his purpose. Firstly, by raising Abraham to be the father of many nations and establishing a covenant relationship with Abraham's descendants. Yet even then we can make out the outline of the great plan of salvation. When Abraham was about to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, we read the promise that God himself will provide the lamb. God himself will provide the lamb. That's Genesis 22, verse 8. And throughout the Old Testament, there are prophecies, many prophecies of the Messiah who will come. There are 44 in total, if you want to look for them. That's a quiz, isn't it? Genesis 3, 15, he will crush your head to the serpent. Psalm 22, Psalm 69, Isaiah 7, verse 14, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, a child will be born to us, and the rest of it you know. Isaiah 11, Isaiah 40, 50, 53, 61, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Bethlehem Ephrathah, out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel, and many others. Today's Palm Sunday, four days before the climax of the story. And we've just reread John's account of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem and his prediction of his forthcoming death. These events are so well known that it isn't easy to see past the familiar to what is actually happening. We know that the crowd who greeted Jesus along the road into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday thought they were seeing the Messiah. Well, they were right there. But they thought this Messiah was going to lead some kind of successful rebellion or uprising to deliver them from Roman occupation. That's why they cut palm branches 
and laid them down in front of him, because that's what you did when a victorious military leader returned in triumphal procession. The clue to what was really going on on Palm Sunday lies in Luke's Gospel, in chapter 9, verse 51. The whole tone of Luke's narrative changes at this point at the end of the Galilean ministry, when Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. That's the NIV. Other translations have slight variations. Jesus resolutely, intently, or steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. The Amplified Bible clarifies it even further by adding to fulfill his purpose. You can sense the iron determination to carry on and complete what his father has given him to do, despite the horror that lies ahead. It's the same as the feeling you get from Jesus' rejection of Peter in Matthew 16, verse 23. Jesus has been telling the disciples that he has to go to Jerusalem and will be arrested and killed. Peter actually rebukes him and is rewarded with, Get out of my sight, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus knows he must go to Jerusalem, confront the authorities there, and submit to arrest and execution in order for his father's purpose to redeem humanity to be fully accomplished. The unfolding of this drama actually begins in chapter 11 of John's Gospel when Jesus stakes his claim to being God by raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. There can have been no doubt that this was a genuine miracle. Martha demurs when Jesus tells them to remove the stone from Lazarus' tomb. By this time there's a bad smell, Lord. He's been in there for four days. Jesus was, Lazarus was definitely dead, no question. Jesus had even delayed returning to Bethany by two days, saying amazingly that the sickness would not end in death, but was for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. When the news reached the Pharisees in Jerusalem, from that day on, it says they plotted to take Jesus' life. At the very least, he was blaspheming, and they couldn't cope with any other ideas. Whether through genuine religious scruples, or because Jesus threatened the social order under Rome, or even their precious security and authority. The raising of Lazarus had upped the ante, so to speak. But what happens next really raises the stakes. Jesus will declare himself by publicly fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9. At a time when the maximum number of witnesses will be present. Jerusalem just before Passover would have been heaving with thousands of people. Can't do anything in secret. Palestinian Jews and pilgrims from far and wide. Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This arrangement whereby the disciples would find the donkey for Jesus to ride must have been pre-planned. It must have been. Matthew's account makes it clear that both the colt and its mother 
were brought to Jesus. The cult had never been ridden before, so its mother's presence was essential to keep it calm as they rode through the jostling, noisy crowds. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing and precisely the effect it will have on the religious authorities. I'm going to paraphrase, but it's pretty much, here I am, come and get me, do your worst. And eventually they comply through the actions of Judas who betrayed Jesus to them. We're nearing the climax of the story of salvation. Jesus' first act in Jerusalem is to drive out of the temple all those who were defiling it with dishonest trading. And his last few days are spent healing and teaching in the temple by day and returning to Bethany each evening to rest. He confronts the Pharisees still more with inflammatory parables like that of the wicked tenants who murdered the son of the vineyard's owner. Matthew twenty-one thirty-three, And a great deal more. And he spent time with his disciples trying to prepare them for what was to come. They aren't able to understand until later, of course, that everything that will happen is part of God's great plan and purpose to turn the tide of history. John 12, 16 says, we've already read it. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. The situation is moving out of the control of the religious elite. Jesus' popularity is such that though they would like to stop him, the priests don't lay a hand on him in public for fear of a riot. Caiaphas, the high priest, finally decides that it is fitting that one man should die for the people. And Jesus is arrested at night. We are almost at the point where the hinge turns. May God bless us all this week as we follow Jesus along the road to the cross and see him pass through death to the glory of the resurrection. Amen.